The International Center for Integrated Mountain Developments Knowledge Park is situated at Godavari in the southern slopes of Kathmandu, Nepal. Sprawling in over 30 hectares of land, which is more than 70 acres, the park was established in March 1993. With a vision of seeing is believing, the park is an open space for demonstrating eco-friendly technologies, approaches and practices that will help to enhance the livelihoods of mountain farmers. Major activities at the Isimode Knowledge Park include vegetation management, soil management and biodiversity conservation. Water management is also among the major activities at the park. The park abounds with demonstration of how water can be managed and its multiple purposes. Inadequate water, not only for drinking, but also for farming, is a growing concern in the region. On the other hand, heavy rainfall over a short period of time can be destructive as it leads to soil erosion. An estimated 150 million people living in the Hindu Kush Himalayan region is faced with water scarcity. Isimot says there's a need to improve water management practices. The park showcases numerous methods of water management to provide water for both households and farming. More than 30 minutes walk through the leech infested forest of the park took us to the Sunguri Kola. Samden Lama Sherpa explains how water from the river is tapped for various purposes. Uh, we have harvested the water from the, from the upstreams and then we are demonstrating to use this uh, the same water for income generation activities by introducing uh, rainbow trotfish farming and the same water, water can be used to generate electricity and it can be also used for irrigation by the downstream farmers. If farmers just want to go for rainbow trout fish farming, then they can collect the water in the big ponds and then below the big pond they can build many small ponds where they can introduce the fingerling and they can purely go for rainbow trout fish farming. Continuous inflow and outflow of water is necessary for the rainbow trout farming. The outflow of water is used for demonstration of low-cost electricity production. Trout farming in water harvested from rivers is an example of a livelihood that farmers can take up. The water that flows out of the trout pond is used to generate electricity. Power is generated using the Peltric Set technology. The technology enables power generation from a small quantity of water dropped from a large height. The device consists of an induction generator that runs with a Peltron turbine. The device is simple to operate and requires only a little maintenance. It can be used to generate electricity for rural and remote mountainous areas. The demonstrated set produces 200 watts of electricity sufficient to light 18 energy-saving fluorescent bulbs. At the park, rainwater is harvested in a pond. Uh, monsoon rainwater harvesting technology is replicated uh, in many many uh, places in Nepal as well as uh, other other region member countries also. Here we are using this uh, aldo boiler seed pollen plastic seed uh, mainly to avoid the uh, ground seepage, uh, so that uh, will uh, so that there will be water throughout the year in the pond. Rooftop rainwater harvesting is another way of doing it. 
The rainwater is collected from the rooftop and stored in ferro-cement jars. This can be for drinking as well as irrigation purposes. Isimod says the rain harvesting techniques will be useful particularly for the mountain farmers and other places where seasonal rain is followed by dry season. The other methods of water management seen in the park are stone-lined waterways. This is to help reduce soil erosion. This one is called drip irrigation. It is designed to provide water efficiently in row crops. And this is treadle pump, which is a method of lifting water up to 20 feet from the water source. The Knowledge Park also demonstrates simple, low-cost renewable technologies that can be used by farmers to enhance their livelihood. These include usage of solar energy like solar dryer, solar cooker and solar lamp, among others. Beehive briquetting technology is something that is gaining popularity in the hilly areas of Nepal. The workers at the park demonstrate how beehive briquettes are produced. It is produced from unwanted biomass and industrial waste like rice husk, sawdust and even waste papers. The forest weeds are converted into charcoal. Charcoal is mixed with clay at the ratio of 3 is to 1. It is then pressed into honeycomb shaped molds and sun dried. The bio briquettes, the park officials say, is an eco-friendly source of energy that can be used for cooking and heating. We also have very good success stories in bio briquette production, where we especially in uh, uh, hilly mountain areas of Nepal see the production of bio briquettes as a very good income possibilities, but also a possibility to help out with the cooking and warming of homestays and tea houses uh, around the trekking routes. So we have um, seen an, an uptake by, uh, by women, uh, providing them not only with the heat and cooking possibilities for their own home, but also possibilities to sell the bio briquettes to, uh, uh, to farmers and to neighbors, uh, to colleagues. Cool chamber to store farm produce which is constructed with locally available materials like bricks and stones is another technology that farmers can easily take up. This is also called a zero energy technology because it does not require any electricity. So, so this is very simple. So you can just build a wall. You can use brick to build a wall. So between the wall there's a cavity and the cavity is filled with the sand. So on the top of the sand you can sprinkle waters uh, then when there's a sprinkle water, then the sand becomes moist, then there's the evaporation inside the cool chambers. And then it will work as a cold storage. So you can store vegetables from, uh, from one week to up to 15 days. Uh, having very simple, easily maintained uh, cold chambers, uh, we sure can make a big difference from, from farmers' uh, abilities to store and store in a better quality of, of different kinds of vegetables and fruits. So I'm sure that uh, one of uh, uh, replicating uh, uh, a simple thing like a coach end but can make a, a big difference for quite a lot of farmers. To increase the income generation of the mountain farmers, the EC Mort's Knowledge Park also focuses on testing and demonstrating wide range of cash crops. The park obtains different plants and seeds from EC Mort's partners in different countries of the Hindukush Himalayan region. They carry out the feasibility studies of climatic and soil conditions of crops. Kiwi or Chinese gooseberries are one of many cash crops cultivated for demonstration 
in the park. Isimot's knowledge park started kiwi farming a decade ago. Kiwi is mainly grown from 1,000 meter to up to 2,000 meter very easily. And it is considered as one of the high value cash crop. And uh, especially uh, we can grow different kind of fruit trees and also other vegetables uh, together with the kiwi. For example, we can use uh, kiwi as a shade crop for teas, but we can also intercrop with the citrus and also with medicinal aromatic plants. And you can see also in the kiwi there's male and uh, female plants. So you can see uh, the plants which bearing fruit is a female plant and you can see uh, the plant without uh, fruit is a male plant. So male plant does flower but it does not bear fruit. So if you want to establish a orchard then the recommended ratio is one male and eight female plants. The vines grow up to nine meters long. The kiwi fruit is a brown, large and egg-sized oval covered with fuzz. The fruits are harvested while still hard and ripen off the wine. The park knowledge officer said that since it is a high-value cash crop, more and more farmers in Nepal are taking keen interest in growing kiwi. In eastern Nepal of Ilam district, many farmers have now taken up kiwi cultivation. 50-year-old Taramani Khatiwada from Sulubung was among the first to start kiwi cultivation in his village back in 2007. He said he first saw kiwi in one of the supermarkets in Kathmandu and he was surprised to know it is an expensive fruit. He quit his government job to start kiwi cultivation. At present, he grows kiwi in 3.5 hectares of land which is more than 8 acres. One method to grow kiwi is to take a year old sapling and graft it with either a male or female kiwi tree that is already fruiting. We plant the grafted saplings after a year. In another method, we could use rootstock plants which start bearing fruits in five to seven years, but it is not advisable. There are high chances of the plants turning out to be male and they wouldn't bear fruits. We could also directly plant kiwi by cutting the branches, but these plants will bear fruits only a year later as compared to those planted using other methods. The first priority is grafted saplings. Taramani says kiwi cultivation is much easier than other crops. He also runs a company in his village where he provides training to other farmers on kiwi farming. He also supplies kiwi saplings to other farmers. Kiwi farming has proved to be a God's gift to farmers like us living in the hilly areas. The fruits from 10 to 15 kiwi plants can earn about two to 300,000 Nepalese rupees. I am sure kiwi farming will work for other living in Himalayan regions like Bhutan, Nepal and Himachal Pradesh and Kashmir in India. It can help enhance livelihoods of farmers in these places. In 2012, Isimot awarded him a Green Champion Award for promoting kiwi farming and other green techniques of Knowledge Park in Ilam. After starting Kiwi Plantation, I visited Isimod's Godavari Park, where there are demonstrations of different varieties of fruits. From there I learned about Kiwi and the technical knowledge of growing the fruit. Isimod's Knowledge Park is an open university for all of us, farmers, students and researchers. At present, he sells his fruits in the markets of Nepal. He's optimistic that there will be no shortage of markets for kiwi. In the future, if we are able to carry out large-scale kiwi cultivation, we have ready market in India and China too. 
We already receive online demands for the fruit from countries like Bhutan, Bangladesh, Iraq and Saudi Arabia. So we can export the fruit to these countries too, with improved quality and packaging. Like Tara Mani, there are other farmers who say they are able to earn good income from kiwi. They said that kiwi farming has fewer challenges as compared to other crops. Kiwi is easier to cultivate than other crops. It does not need to be tended on a daily basis. We need to tend it only twice a year. The fruits fetched more price than we expected. We even sold it for 500 to 600 Nepalese rupees a kilogram. Those of us who own small farms also got good returns. Farmers also use kiwi to produce locally made jam, juice and wine. We don't have any electric machines, so our products are purely homemade. Isimot is also promoting kiwi cultivation in other member countries, including Bhutan. We have seen a keen interest in replicating the growing of kiwi fruits. Uh, the climate in Bhutan will be excellent for, for setting up uh, plantations of, of kiwi fruit, also using it as intercropping for other kinds of, uh, of fruits. But we are quite sure that the, uh, the kiwi fruit growing will be a very good addition to value chains, to better livelihoods and to income generation for, for Bhutanese farmers. So I think that might be the single most important of the technologies we have. Isimot says Bhutan has expressed their interest to start kiwi farming, adding that talks are already underway with their partners in Bhutan to initiate kiwi cultivation. Isimot says kiwi is one of the success stories of Knowledge Park in encouraging farmers to take up high-value fruit farming. EC Mode promotes green technologies that will be applicable to the mountain farmers. The director of the program says EC Mode's knowledge park is a concept. One cannot say that, okay, we will take this whole thing and replicate it somewhere else. There are many things which are relevant for a certain uh, areas, so it's a concept. I think for me, it's the knowledge, it's the concept, the approach that Godavari provides is very much applicable to all the eight countries. And it's a basket of uh, technologies and approach and people can pick from that what is relevant for them. So I uh, think um, we encourage and there has been also in our uh, discussion with the board members every time they feel that we should have such a park. Uh, in each of the countries and we encourage that and we have said we would like to support each of the countries if they develop such park we will provide technical support. EC Mode's Knowledge Park also attracts a large number of students and trainees who visit the park for study tour and for field trip. Me along with this uh, are my colleague from Institute of Forestry, Hitora Campus, Hitora are here for the educational tour. Yeah, this is the um, very important for the students and for the um, in futures as well as in course as well as in the field studies. Actually we are here to know about, know about how IC mode is working um, working to um, uh, improve uh, improve the um, mountainous uh, people's uh, livelihood. In a year some 600 to 700 policymakers visit the Knowledge Park to study the various methodologies and range of interventions that will enhance the livelihood of mountain farmers. The park also organizes training for farmers, government officials and NGO staff, among others, to disseminate information and knowledge from the park. The Director General of EC Mode says the Godavari Knowledge Park is extremely important to show green technologies to the mountain communities. What we can do is give people a vision of what could happen in mountain areas, right, by showing these technologies, how they fit in the environment, but also how 
mixed uh, nature is with these technologies. So when you go out to Godavari, it's a magical place, right? You have forest, uh, you've got some orchards, you have these uh, technologies in place all mixed together. So it re really is people, mountain people working with nature uh, to, to really uh, benefit both society as well as uh, the mountain ecosystems. So to give that vision uh, is an extremely important way forward. And there's nothing better than uh, showing people what's possible. That vision is much better than writing many reports. EC Mode is a knowledge, learning, and enabling center developing and sharing information and knowledge using communications to empower the eight regional members of the Hindu Kush Himalayan region. The member countries are Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, China, India, Myanmar, Nepal, and Pakistan.